Welcome everyone. This is Dr. Jait Lee, your cardiologist from New York on your favorite website, MoneyMeterHealth.com, which is dedicated to teaching you about the human heart and its illnesses across the globe, mainly through our social channels that we have our videos on. So once again, thank you for your enthusiastic interest in supporting my cause and furthering this cause freely to all to educate everybody about the human heart awareness and, uh, and of course, cardiology. So without any further ado, I'd like to delve into the subject matter and uh, the matter of the subject today we're going to talk about on this video is specifically is long QT syndrome. There are three types, one, two, and three, and they're all mutations that occur uh, from a gene that's uh, so it's, it's a genetic mutation one and two normally occur during stress or during the times of fright for instance that's when the long QT syndrome develop and the three the, the long uh, the LQTS3 type occurs during sleep so that's dangerous obviously there's no marker here there's no provocation and a person can actually develop a torso so what happens is long QT syndrome is characterized by syncope Obviously, you'll have to have clinical presentation. The ECG will show a torsad pattern, a torsad depoint, we call it, which is very, very characteristic of a polymorphic VT, where actually the ECG will, I can show it to you quickly what it looks like. It more looks like more looks like a spindle going on its own so there's a high voltage and diminishing voltage here as you see and then high voltage again and diminishing so this is a polymorphic vt we call it and that's the torso at the point and this eventually goes into vf and then obviously into sudden cardiac death can ensue so just be mindful that the ecg pattern will be a torso at the point a syncope pattern and then of course prior to uh, prior to the patient going to vt one sees on an ecg a long QT syndrome. What is it? A long QT syndrome where the QTC corrected. Now remember the QT is measured. It's normally it's anywhere between uh, 440 to 445 milliseconds. But if it goes beyond 500 milliseconds, that's when the problems arise. All so you see how how narrow the margin is for our uh, patho uh, pathological uh, long QT syndromes. So anything more than 500 milliseconds is a diagnosis of LQTS syndrome and these are the patients who are actually having syncope and presenting with torsad on an EKG or, uh, or, or a long QT um, you know, a manifestation. Now these are congenital varieties. Now then you have an acquired variety. What is an acquired variety? Acquired variety results from drugs medications obviously and then it also results from electrolyte abnormalities what are the classic electrolyte abnormalities low potassium and a low magnesium so either of these two a hypomagnesemia hypokalemia will result into um, long QT syndrome which is of an uh, LQTS of an acquired variety drugs specifically in the antibiotic list do not forget e-mycin because that has been recently reported in a whole rash of all these patients in the past uh, several years Z, uh, zithromax uh, these are the two antibiotics clindamycin and uh, pentamidine these are all qt prolonging drugs and do not forget of course the antiarrhythmics like the sotalol for instance and this is a very, very notorious amiodrone itself. And now that is on the rise, by the way. Amiodrone is being used a lot. Of. So remember, whenever you're using all these drugs, you have to have a QT monitoring going in these patients again. So again, there are better antibiotics than EMIS and ZMAX. So try to use other antibiotics. But Sotalol, amiodrone, procainamide. This is a very, very notorious drug for uh, torsad okay and then quinidine quinidine in fact quinidine syncope was well defined in those years when quinidine was being used now nobody uses it in fact early on i was using it and of course we all the time had these problems with torsad uh, in hospitals or out of hospitals and there was a time when you could not start procainamide or quinidine light drugs because there are no other antiarrhythmic drugs available but you had to bring these patients in the in the hospital and then actually uh, intravenously actually demonstrate that these patients don't go into um, prolongation of QT and then you adjust the dose and then discharge these patients. Anyway, but right now we have amiodron where again the amiodron levels are measured, the sotalol levels are measured, but again followed by QT 
uh, monitoring on routine EKG when these patients present in the clinics or in the hospitals while these drugs are being started. So do not forget QT monitoring in these patients, okay? But electrolytes, chiefly notorious, are markedly low potassium, specifically around like 2.0, 2.1. Magnesium when the le levels are markedly low, again, hypomagnesemia that can occur. So these are the patients. Now, two things that to be remembered also in the, in the congenital variety, I forgot to mention. One is an autosomal recessive, and then the other is the autosomal dominant. The autosomal recessive is accompanied by deafness. Just remember that. So there is a sensorial auditory loss as well. So these patients also uh, present with uh, deafness. Uh, unfortunately, and so they have autosomal recessive pattern and an autosomal dominant pattern. The autosomal dominant pattern is also called Romano Ward. Romano Ward syndrome. Whereas the autosomal recessive is also called as Gervell uh, Lange Nielsen syndrome, so JLN. So there are two types of uh, long QT syndromes in congenital, just so that you know. So Romano Ward and Gervell Lange Nielsen syndrome. So these are the two types you should remember in the congenital variety. And they may they may ask you on the boards specifically say someone save the child or the or the lady, especially if it's a, because it's again more prevalent in females. Now the lady has some deafness to begin with, and then that'll give you the clue of the, the J. That means it's an autosomal recessive. They're talking about an autosomal recessive type of a syndrome, but it's JLN, and that's uh, Romano Ward is autosomal dominant, and that is again, um, you know, but there is no deafness in that. But uh, the criteria is to make sure that the QT is prolonged beyond 500 milliseconds, and that is the key. And of course, the acquired variety will show up on this. Now, treatment plan, very quickly, I will, again, the treatment plan is very simple. You have to avoid all these drugs, make sure electrolytes are in good shape, and then beta blockers. Use beta blockers, they have a very huge role here. Uh, sympathet uh, sympathectomy is also very good because that, again, uh, prevents all this uh, epinephrine rise in these patients, and as a result, these patients do not develop um, torsad. And uh, last but not the least, but this is very important, and that is very important, ICD placements in a setting where somebody has already demonstrated a syncope, a prolonged QT, and that could not be corrected by electrolyte abnormalities and taking the patients off the drugs. So syncope in the presence of LQTS, and of course, if you have demonstrated a torsad at some point of time, say on a telemetry monitoring or a holter monitoring, then automatically an ICD placement is there. There's no EP required, no electrophysiological study required because that's almost becoming obsolete now. So the whole idea is wanting to see quickly, recognize the LQT syndromes. And of course, as I said, there are three types. The third type really occurs in sleep, so that's more dangerous. So at the end of the day, all three will have almost equal mortality, except the first two can be recognized mostly during the stress times. A quick mention of short QT syndrome on this itself. I do want to do that, and because that will define what is a short QT uh, syndrome. Remember that. Now, a short QT syndrome is another dangerous uh, channelopathy, I call it, and that's again a genetic uh, mutation that occurs. And in this patient, the QT is less than the QTC, which is the corrected C, is less than 200 milliseconds. And these patients also benefit from ICD placements, and this is classic example where they occur only during the stress. So again, these are stress-induced, or wherever there is, uh, um, you know, uh, physical stress involved. So they, can, they classically can occur in a, in a stress lab. Most of these patients that I've seen in my practice, where they go for a cardiac cath, depending upon uh, how uh, how much VT they develop, if they develop a torsad or a VT. Uh, then you shock these patients, bring them back to normal sinus rhythm, and then, of course, transfer these patients for cardiac cath. The cath invariably is negative in these patients, and when if cath is negative, then they end up getting an ICD. You do not need an EP study anymore in these patients, okay? So that's, in a nutshell, a long QT and a short QT that I have defined here for you. And as I said, uh, just be mindful of these syndromes. They'll definitely be on the boards, but, of course, on a day-to-day -day practice also, you'll come across these. And uh, the criteria for long QT syndrome is more than 500 milliseconds. 
milliseconds and criteria for short QT is less than 200 milliseconds and ICD placements is required in both and uh, just recognize the um, importance of various drugs that you have to certainly avoid and make sure these drugs are not on board on these patients before you diagnose a long QT syndrome otherwise they could be reversible because if you take these drugs off you don't need an ICD placement just caution on these drugs alone then it's an acquired form of uh, and of course check the electrolytes make sure the potassium and the magnesium is also checked and replenished so this way you're not running into hypokalemia and hypomagnesemia to cause uh, long QT syndromes in these patients. But again, the hallmark on the ECG is, um, as I said, torsi D point. Okay. Thank you so much for your attention on long QT syndrome and uh, stay tuned with MooneyMeterHealth.com. More coming down your way because this is something very, very important. I'm putting all these into video vignettes and picking up smaller subjects for all of you. So this way you can brush up your uh, medicine before you take the exams. And of course, during your clinical day-to-day -day practice, just like my colleagues do, we always like to brush up our cases before we go and see our patients into our uh, into the hospitals or in the clinic. So I suggest that again, keep viewing, keep watching and I invite your comments, your questions, and your suggestions, please. So do not forget to press the like button also because that tells me that you know you guys are watching and you're liking it too, okay? So very important for me to really get that feedback. So moodymeterhealth.com, your favorite website, which is, which is giving you information freely to all. Once again, this is Dr. Jaitley. So long.